How did this happen? This is an incredible phenomenon, a an amazing problem to try to explain. How did this happen? So I'm just going to go through three, just three brief summaries of seven chapters in the book that I sort of employ at diff from different angles to try to solve this problem. I begin with natural selection and the invisible hand. Uh, Adam Smith was a uh, professor at Glasgow, um, at, uh, uh, and, and in fact, uh, when Darwin was an undergraduate, uh, he studied Adam Smith's uh, works, not just uh, the wealth of nations, but more importantly, his theory of the moral sentiment. So Darwin had a sense of the notion of the invisible hand. And in fact, I'm not the, by any means the first to notice this, but there are similarities between natural selection and the invisible hand. But not analogously so. I've decided that I, I think they're the same thing. Evolution and economics are the same subset of a larger phenomena called complex adaptive systems. That is, systems that grow in complexity from simpler systems, and they grow by learning. They're adaptive. They're autocatalytic. They feed back on themselves as they grow in complexity from simple systems. And that what Smith and Darwin were both after here was trying to explain with some mechanism what we now call complex adaptive systems, but that's just a modern uh, phrase, uh, of how, how to get complex complex seemingly designed systems out of this. So Smith called it the invisible hand, Darwin called it natural selection. Um, I think they're the same thing, not just anal analogously, but similar subsets of a larger phenomenon. And in fact, nature is filled with self-organizing, emergent, complex adaptive systems. Water is a self-organized emergent property of hydrogen and oxygen. Consciousness is a self-organized emergent property of billions of neurons firing in patterns. Complex life is a self-organized emergent property of simple life. Prokaryote cells become eukaryote cells, become multicellular uh, organisms, and, and so forth. Uh, so life evolved from the bottom up, not the top down. This is a nice argument, by the way, uh, to use with conservatives who already understand how markets uh, evolve naturally. They don't need to be designed from the top down. In fact, it's the exact same process with life, and you can look at languages or the law or writing. But markets, nobody could possibly design markets from the top down. Prices today, say, on the internet, just for the airline industry, change something like 40,000 times an hour. There's no committee you could ever set up. There's no number of bureaucrats who could possibly establish those prices. You and I do it. We all do it. Uh, as part of a, a, a large, complex adaptive system called a marketplace or an economy. Um, further uh, analogy, anal analogies that show how this worked, the, this I get from Steve Gould in his Panda's Thumb of Technology. He actually wrote an essay by that title, in which one of the conundrums of evolutionary biologists to explain are these seemingly poorly designed or suboptimally designed. Now I've turned the tables on it, on the intelligent design people, and, and forced to give the problem to them. You explain the suboptimality. We have a nice explanation for it. Why would an intelligent designer design something suboptimally? In evolution, exaptation is the, is the preferred word that Gould uh, coined, and it's an excellent word. It's an adaptation where the current function performed by the adaptation was not the original function performed when the adaptation evolved. The panda's thumb is not a thumb at all. As you can see, there's five digits already anatomically uh, connected through ligaments and nerves and so on for, for what bears do. They, they, they reach out, claw, and scratch. Uh, the thumb is the radial sesamoid bone. It's the wrist bone here. It's this bone that just grew out a tiny bit and it strips the leaves off. So it's an exaptation. It's not an adaptation. It's, it's nicely, nicely designed. It's not brilliant. <laughs> but it's what it had to work with. And the QWERTY keyboard is the is the analogy there with, with the t uh, uh, an acceptation of technology. It's not the most efficient design. Um, there is a, a Dvorak a keyboard. I realize there's debate about whether Dvorak is really that much better than QWERTY, but from the research I've seen, it is. But in any case, it didn't have to be this way. It was only this way because of a series of historical contingencies, and now we're all stuck with the same keyboard because we've all learned it, and no one's going to make the switch to Dvorak, although you can. On your Apple, apparently, you can make the switch <coughs> if you want. Uh, so these are great uh, concepts when you're dealing with intelligent design people, by the way, parenthetically, to use. Uh, how do you explain the wing? Well, here's three pictures of three different uses of wings, all from the same area, all pictures I took on the same day in the Galapagos Islands, the 
blue-footed booby on the left using wings for flying, the flightless cormorant, uh, which uses wings for thermoregulation. It holds them out until it dries. It pulls them back in to, to hold heat. And the wings of the um, little Gal Galapagos penguin um, are used for uh, uh, rudders and uh, for propulsion through the water. So these are examples of exaptation that uh, uh, nature has used, and here's some examples of exaptation in technology from tires to sandals. You can actually download a little pattern and, and cut out a, a piece of tire and make yourself a nice sandal. This is often done in third world countries and California and Oregon. <laughs> <coughs> the exaptation of the steam engine into the internal combustion engine. In other words, uh, nature and, uh, and markets just use whatever is laying around that's available. And uh, there's an excellent book on this, George Basala's book on the evolution of technology. He presents an entire model of natural selection operating in marketplaces in the history of technology and showing how the way technology usually develops is tens of thousands of lots of little trial and error steps along the way, and there's a selection for the most successful as defined by what people want to actually use. Um, and then I th found this, is a, I thought this would be a fun example of exaptation of technology and religion. This is Dehart's Bible and Tyre. The little sign there below it says, Jesus said, if I go away, I will return. I guess that's on a four-wheel drive. Um, anyway, so uh, second of my three major points, um, virtue economics or the morality of markets. Essentially, what I'm doing is, is writing a a sy synthetic book that, that brings together evolutionary economics, <coughs> neuroeconomics, behavior economics, virtue economics, uh, a whole series of these uh, attempts to employ the social sciences and psychology, neuroscience to traditionally economic problems. Um, it's a really interesting, exciting area. And it really does begin with Adam Smith, the Adam Smith that uh, Charles Darwin read as an undergraduate. Uh, one of the most important books. I think this book is more important than The Wealth of Nations. It, it was called The Theory of Moral Sediments. You can download it from, for free on, online. It's, uh, it's not that long. It's really just a longish essay. Um, Smith was a professor of moral philosophy. He was not a political economist. He was a professor of moral philosophy. He had a deeper, larger issue at hand that he was trying to solve. Why, why people are nice or not nice to each other anywhere. The, the economy is just one area. And he writes, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which, which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Of this kind is pity or compassion, the emotion which we feel for the misery of others when we either see it. I don't know, it's a, my computer's gone haywire here. Hang on, let's do a uh, stop here for a second. All right. Everybody think good thoughts. <laughs> Usually this happens at Caltech for some reason. Of this kind is pity or compassion, the emotion which we feel for the misery of others when we either see it or are made to conceive it in a very lively manner. Well, we know there's good neuroscience research on this, on mirror neurons, mirror neurons, where if I watch you move your hand, the neurons in your brain that are commanding your hand to move will also fire in my brain, uh, even though I'm just sitting there, just watching you. So, so there's motor mirror neurons, but there's also emotional mirror neurons. If I watch you in pain, subjects that are given a little shock, or at least that's what it looks like they're getting, uh, and uh, the, the, the subject watching the other person get the shock, uh, is, is, is his brain area that registers pain is also uh, lighting up. These are functional MRI uh, brain scans uh, in these types of subjects. Um, and, and so these motor neurons seem to have something to do with empathy. That is, there's a neural template, a neural pathway that evolved for empathy. The empathy is actually really there. It's not something that you just learn. Of course, you can refine it or squelch it, but it, the potential for it is there.